So ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear friends, students, faculty, and colleagues at the Azvieri Institute of Israel Studies, welcome. And of course, when I say at the Azvieri Institute of Israel Studies, it's a very global at. Many of you, such as our distinguished uh, featured speaker tonight, Lilak Benzvi, I can say Dr. Lilak Benzvi, is joining uh, us. I hope in a few days. In a few days. So we already give you, we already give you the doctorate. Uh, yeah, and yeah. their friends so. are joining us from Israel. And of course, many, many of you are joining us from a very snowy and very cold Montreal. Yes, indeed. And the temperature and uh, the day when you look outside reminds us just how cold, bitterly cold Montreal can be. So we are trying to bring a little bit of intellectual warmth onto your screens and into the discussion uh, and into our, into our thoughts. Uh, and engagement tonight. My name is Chaba Nikolényi. I'm director of the Azriel Institute of Israel Studies and also professor of political science at Concordia University. As many of you know, this year, this academic year is a very special one for us at the Institute as we are celebrating the completion of the first decade of our activities at Concordia. And it's really such a delight to uh, bring to our campus, even if it's virtual, and to bring to you in conversation with you, young talent, young scholarship, young brains from Israel. And Lilak is one such wonderful and fine example of the next generation of Israeli scholarship. Uh, those of you who have been following our events might remember Lilak's very well received earlier talk in the fall semester when she told us about her understanding and assessment from a political philosophical perspective of uh, Shomrei Homot and the thereafter, the difficult um, uh, altercations and clashes that took place between the two large uh, national groups that are often vying for control, for competition uh, in, uh, in Israel. Today, Lilak is joining us once again, but today she is going to tell us about a very important topic that comes more directly out of her doctoral dissertation. And as you might have heard a few minutes ago, it's only a few days away that she's officially going to be confirmed, conferred the title of the doctorate. Lilak is, going to, uh, Lilak is going to tell us today about neither private nor political, the political philosophy of Yeshaya Hulaibovic. No doubt many of you heard or read uh, or discussed the, according to some controversial, but according to all, thought-provoking, fascinating political philosophy of, uh, of Yeshayar Hulagovic's. So it's really such a pleasure, such a treat, that we can have the author of uh, a hot-of-the-press doctoral dissertation to tell us what, Yesh what Yeshayar Hulagovic stood for and why we should take his ideas seriously today when Israel is still trying to come to terms with difficult questions about its Jewish, about its de uh, democratic, and in general, about the nature of the state and, and about the country's political identity. Uh, in addition to finishing and being a doctoral candidate at the University of Haifa, Lilak uh, also, and we are truly fortunate to have her as a visiting, virtually visiting research associate at the Israel Institute of Israel Studies, but Lilak is also serving as um, in a distinguished position as a research associate at the Shalom Hartman Institute uh, in Jerusalem. And of course, the Shalom Hartman Institute, which has very important and deep connections, the history thereof with the city of Montreal. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, let me turn, if not the floor, but at least the screen, over to our dear friend, Lilak. Lilak, the screen is yours. Thank you. So first, let's uh, uh, share a screen and hope it will be that it will be fine. Great. Okay. You see it as it's supposed to be, like very big. Perfect. Okay. So if I'm pushing, can you see yeah. Leibovich now? Yeah. Okay. So everything is fine. Let's put it uh, right on the start. Okay. So thank you, uh, Chaba. So uh, you, al you already introduced me, so I'll restart uh, right away with talking about my research and uh, less about myself. So my research belongs to political philosophy and deals with creating and maintaining civil consent in the modern state. 
And I'm interested in how we can live together and when our society is so pluralistic and divided. And when we do live together, uh, what are the core values, if there is any, uh, that holds our community together? Now, I wrote about uh, the Jewish and democratic state. So my work is related to Jewish studies and Israel studies. However, the reason I talk about Israel, besides it is uh, my state, is that I study and al- analyze the political uh, thought uh, of Ishaya Ulebovich. Uh, he was a Jewish philosopher who passed away more than 25 years ago, was born in Russia, moved to Germany, but he spent most of his life in Israel, Jerusalem, and his political thought was about Judaism, the Jewish people uh, in the modern era, and the state of Israel as a current Jewish state. And Leibovitch wasn't very interesting to find ways people can live peacefully together, and you can say the opposite is true. He didn't believe we could live together in harmony, and he didn't have a lot of faith uh, in humanity in general. Also, Leibovitch uh, didn't deal with the general questions that thinkers who deal with citizenship consent ask. Uh, but he did talk about it through his writing about uh, the Jewish people and the Jewish state. So I thought it would be fascinating to take his specific work and check whether I can say something general about civil consent in a modern state. So I took a philosopher that is an outsider to most of the issues I wanted to deal with in my research, uh, citizenship, nationalism, multiculturalism, the political sphere. Leibovitch talks about all of this, but he doesn't always do it directly and not in the accurate academic way that thinkers usually work. Uh, He wasn't obligated to that, um, but I am. So first and foremost, my work belongs to political science. And I think this is interesting uh, to bring an outsider uh, to this debate. So today I want to present an idea from my dissertation, which deals with the idea of the public sphere. Now, the public sphere is inseparable from the notion of civil consent. And the more I depend in my, in my writing about how we can live together, I realized how the public sphere is present and how fundamental it is to political philosophy. And I want to present an idea that challenges some axioms and premises regarding this idea of the public of the public sphere. And I will do it. So I do so through Leibovitch's uh, political thought. So what is what is the public sphere? Like it sounds, it is a place that is not private. Uh, Arendt, Hannah Arendt, points about two meanings of public. The realm in which things appear in public when you can be seen and heard by others, and by that maybe take part and influence on what is happening. And the realm uh, that we share as people, as a place that distinct from the private, which belongs only to me. So you can see that, right? I have this fear that no one, oh, okay, good. So all the issues regarding the public sphere are related to these two meanings. People want to be heard and seen and people want to feel they belong and that this shared realm is also their uh, real. Um, and this idea of the public sphere implies that there is another sphere which is not public, but rather private. If you have a public place in the sense I mentioned, it means some place is not that, some place is not public. And indeed the modern state, particularly the liberal state, can be seen as responsible for this division between public and private, or uh, let's say non-public. And we can debate uh, when, it, when precisely this division started. However, I will go with uh, Michael Walzer here that said it was the modern era and more precisely it was liberalism uh, that divided between what is public and what is private. And public, and public is not the only character of this sphere. It is not even the main one. Before there is a public sphere, 
there is a political sphere. From a liberal perspective, this is mainly the same. Um, this is mainly the same place, the political and public sphere. Well, we may distinguish between them, like as Habermas did, uh, there is an institutional sphere that enables the existence of the public sphere, or as uh, Rawls did, we can talk about the background culture the, to manage public debates. However, from a liberal point of view, we refer to all of this as part of the political sphere. It may have divisions and uh, sections and different parts can have different roles, but we cannot escape, so it seems, from this division in our modern life, private versus public and political. Now, what drives this division is the desire to protect the citizen and give him as much space as possible to choose his freedom um, to choose his freedom and own way of life. More precisely, the liberal state doesn't want to deal with all the different values and perceptions in our society because it, do it doesn't have a lot of tools, it doesn't have tools like at all to decide between them. Rawls, as a liberal thinker, expressed it most accurately, I think, when he said, the question is, what is the list that must be asserted? And if it must be asserted, what is the least controversial form? Because we, as a society, need something uh, to unite us, something that will enable us to create a shared place called the public sphere, where people can be seen and heard, it will be belong to all of us. However, we need to be very careful about it, because if we start to use certain values and others not to define this space, we will neither lose citizens cooperation, nor lose the ability to call ourselves a democracy. So what we want to do uh, is to create the public sphere as a place that all citizens can endorse. And for that, we need, we need to make sure that only the minimum, only political values, that is how Rawls puts it, are involved. So we create a political civil constraint that is the basis for our political public sphere as citizens. And everything that does not go with that consent, all values and conception that uh, could not achieve consensus in society, they are not fading away, but in a way they are, because they have been pushing to the private, to the private sphere when they are allegedly protected. Okay, if you don't have a place in the political or in the public sphere, you belong to the private, go home. Now, this is getting, this view is getting a much criticism. This modern and liberal economy between private and public is something that is under attack since the second half of the 20th century and until today. Who is attacking this position? Who does it? feminism, multiculturalism, communitarianism. Today we also have movements like uh, Me Too, uh, Black Lives Matters. These different, very different movements and ideas are saying different things and asking for different things, but they are saying this is not working. When you divide the reality in the modern state into private and public, the way liberalism does, you are either wrong or creating a disturbing reality. So the central claims against this modern and liberal public sphere uh, are, I would like to mention, I would like to mention a few. Okay, the first step, the first criticism it say, is saying, this is not enough. What we call a liberal consensus that enables us to talk about a shared public sphere is not, a, let us say, thick enough to create the vital society we want to. The liberal public sphere may enable us uh, to live side by side without killing each other, which is important, but that is not enough. We want to build a life together. We want to cooperate and have solidarity and friendship for all of that. A sphere articulating the minimum uh, we can share is just not enough at, at a time of crisis. Just like now, these days, 
we will find out that this liberal minimum uh, doesn't have the power to convince people to get out of their comfort zone, to cooperate with each other, maybe even to put aside the rights for a short amount of time. Another criticism I want to mention is that this public sphere is not public. It is not all the citizens' public sphere. It is a public sphere for, let's say, young, white men, uh, privileged men, that is for sure. However, if you are not mainstream, and a lot of people are not, you will have difficulty finding yourself in that sphere. For some, it will be difficult, and for others, it will be impossible. Let's say women, national minorities, religious group, immigrants, and more. I know this is not accurate. I know that we cannot say women is just this little a blue a circle, but this is multiculturalism. This is the multiculturalism saying, point out the need for the public sphere to be more inclusive uh, so that more people can identify as their public sphere and act within its borders. The term here is political culture. The public sphere articulates a certain culture and the more a citizen's language, history and beliefs are different from that culture, he will have a hard time seeing this sphere as his own. So a good public sphere and a good civil consent will find a way, let's say, to include these groups in the public sphere to make sure they have a place there. And another related criticism is that the public and private lines need to be redefined because when we say something is private, we push away from the public eye essential public issues, which should not be private. For example, violence against women, women and kids inside the family, private groups and close groups like religious communities. What happens there happens in a private zone, but it is not a private matter. The calling here is for the political sphere to get into the private place and make essential issues uh, public and political. Now, I, I am also criticizing this distinction between the public and the private. But what interests me is the connection between the political and the public. Is that an inseparable bond? So these two must always go together, political and public. That depends on how we define the public and how we define the political. And in my research, I define these ideas through Leibovitch's, Leibovitch's work. And what I want to do is to look separately at the political and the public. And I will start with the political, which is uh, uh, easier to explain in Leibovitch's theory. The political is a place of power. And more than that, it is a place when the demonic dwells. This is Leibovitch's, this is Leibovitch's words. How do people live together? Only by having or instituting a mechanism that has authority over them and, co and coercive power. A mechanism that organizes the relationship between them, even if it must to do by force. And in Leibovitch's eyes, the political serves as a power of coercion that regulates human relationship and allows them to coexist without harming one another. And in that sense, uh, is like Hobbes, which says that without the state, we will face a war of all against all. Um, this is what Leibovitch is saying. This is exactly what Leibovitch is saying, that the political is a necessary sphere for the existence of human life, but also a dangerous one. And even a demonic one. What is so scary about the political sphere? Since the, state, since, since the state's main job is to ensure we will not hurt each other, it holds much power. Moreover, when using this power, the political sometimes allow itself to speak in the name of specific values. For example, my state uh, forbade me to go to the synagogue two years ago. And the explanation, very logic one, uh, was that it was to make sure I'm not getting hurt by COVID or hurting other people, hurting other people. So in the name of security and health, 
the political sphere, my political sphere, restricted me, restricted, restricted its citizens. What is the problem? What is the problem with that? Um, we have the criticism I just mentioned, saying we want the state to use all citizens' values. If we have minorities, their values need also to be considered when the states act. So if the state want people to stay at home, it needs to make sure all citizens understand why it is important. But that is not what Bader and Leibovich, he is afraid the state will reverse the order, not to act to fulfill a value, but use a value in order to act. So in the example, I just mentioned of COVID. How can we know that restricting citizens allegedly for their safety is not done for something else, let's say, as gaining power for political leaders? It depends on whether or not we trust the state. I trusted my state, so I stayed home. But Levovich doesn't trust the state. And more than that, he's saying no one can trust a sphere with so much power. We need a state, but we also need to restrict it as much as possible. He's saying, as for us, who are not fascists, we ask the state for nothing except that it should not prevent people from striving towards those things that they consider values. From this perspective, the advantage of a regime can be judged by the weakness of the governmental mechanism. The less the governmental mechanism can force its will on its subject, the better. True, it is necessary for the governmental mechanism to have coercive power, but this power must be reduced to the bare minimum. Unfortunately, this minimum is still very, very uh, large. Um, Lebovich is asking, what is the minimum power the political sphere needs? That is what it should have, and even that, is probably too much. So maybe that is a bit superficial to say that the state is dangerous, but Leibovitch was honestly and deeply afraid of the political sphere's power. First and foremost, the power and ability of the sphere to take life, innocent life. The fear form and just bloodshed was Leibovitch's primary and deepest fear regarding the political sphere. And to this, we add his fear to his values and what the state may do to them. Now we can see this fear when Leibovitch is talking about the creation of the state of Israel as a moral experiment for the Jewish people. Now he's saying, our moral test arrived when we, the barriers of a morality that detest the spilling of the blood of innocent, became able and responsible for carrying out issues of defense and security, issue was problems occasionally seem to be able to be solved by spilling the blood of innocent. Um, the, establishment, the establishment of the Jewish state is a big deal uh, for Leibovitch, the biggest deal. He called this the horrible question regarding the existence of a Jewish nation, that established a Jewish, but definitely not religious state. And here we see an aspect of this um, horrible question, dealing with a political sphere that carries the possibility of killing innocent people. And Leibovitch was disturbed by that possibility. And even more from the scenario, something like that, killing innocent people will happen in the name of Jewish values. Uh, that the political sphere, which is the state of Israel, we do immoral things in the name of allegedly uh, Jewish values. Now, there is a lot to say about that fear regarding the state of Israel. We can look at the history of the state, uh, his, its political climate and the Jewish aspect, of course, uh, but I don't want to do that. I want to stay on the philosophical level and examine what kind of public sphere we get when the political sphere is so scary and demonic. If the political sphere, sphere is so problematic, we would assume Leibovitch would do his best 
not to stay there. In a sense, he will strive to protect its, his values from the political. And indeed, that is labor which stands. The citizen should keep his faith, values, and ends from the hand of the state. We should not let the political sphere get us because this sphere is only an instrument and values have no place there. This is labor which is saying, if the state has no meaning in terms of values, it must be addressed in terms of its instrumental meaning. And right away, one should add to what has already been said. Not only is the state not a value, but it is not even an instrument to realize values. Um, we can see that Leibovitch is against the idea of civil consent here. He doesn't believe civil consent is possible because people cannot agree about anything and they may even kill each other without coercive political power over them. So beside taking care, uh, we will not kill each other. Uh, the state has no responsibility. And more than that, it cannot set an agreement over values between us. That is just not possible. And please notice that Lebovich is claiming the state is not a value. Therefore, it has no value meaning, and therefore it is not even an instrument for fulfilling values. Now, most liberals will, will agree with Lebovich that the state is not a value, of course not the value, but is this necessary tool cannot get near values without destroying them for Leibovitch? No, it, it cannot. That is exactly what it means. When the political sphere, its institutions, is, is talking in the name of values, let's say Jewish values, that is only one thing. That is fascism. There is no maneuvering uh, space here. For this reason, Lebovich end, uh, endorses the separation of religion and state in Israel. He doesn't want to protect the state from the face of religion. In the encounter between the Jewish state and the Jewish faith, Judaism, he cares about the latter. So what I'm presenting here is a form of an anti-liberal position, which goes against the idea of civil consent and against any striving to embed religion into the state institutions. And looking deeper, we can see how much this is not a liberal stance, uh, uh, Leibovitch's uh, stance, because we could think that, we can think that when Leibovitch wants his fate out of the political sphere, when he wants his values out of the political sphere, he will call his, he will call a liberal call for putting them in the private sphere where they are allegedly belong and also protected. Now, in liberalism, what, whatever is not belong to political to the political sphere will be pushed to the private sphere. But that is not Leibovitch's position at all. According to Leibovitch, one needs to take his values out of the political sphere, but not into the private sphere. Okay, let, let us look what he is claiming here. Values cannot be realized through a governmental mechanism. They can only be realized through the efforts and struggles of people as individuals. The meaning of the state regarding values is not that the state is an instrument for realizing values, but that it allows people to struggle for values. As for us, who are not fascists, we ask the state for nothing, except that it should not prevent people for, from striving toward those things that they consider values. Now, when Leibovitch says that the state should only make sure that citizens can fight for their values, he doesn't mean they will do it at home. Chasing your values at home, at the private sphere, has no meaning for Leibovitch. Sure, back in the days, let us say, when the Jewish people were at the, the Gola, the Galut, they only had the private sphere. The Jewish community was there, Leibovitch uh, call, calls it, Dalet Amot of Halacha. They did not need to deal with issues like making just wars, economy in Shabbat, 
national education system. They, did not, they didn't have a political sphere, only a private one. However, today in the modern era, when there is a Jewish state, they, they are not worth much if one values are at home. So when Leibovitch calls us to take our, our values out of the state's hand, he doesn't mean to take them home. So I truly hope right now, if you are with me, you understand we have a problem. Because if the political is not a good place for citizens to fight for their values, and the private is not a good place either, where exactly are citizens supposed to make this fight an effort? The modern and liberal dichotomy between private and public is not working here. We need a third sphere to make this fight possible. This is the public sphere. I want to present an idea of a public sphere that is in a way is similar to the liberal one, a place where people can be heard and seen and which belong to all of us. But what is unique in Leibovitch's position is that this sphere is not only not political. This sphere's essence is in the effort and fight to escape the political, the struggle to be saved from the political and not push to the private. This effort creates the public sphere. Now, the, the public sphere is the eternal fight of the citizen to achieve his values by willing to pay a price for them. Not by turning to the political, to the state, and say, make this value possible for me. And not by protecting this value at home in a private place, but by fight to make this value possible outside. This fight is the, pub, is the public sphere. Now, create a sphere by a fight means that we are not addressing the political sphere as, a, as the responsible adult but as a coercive power that himself needs supervision. But we need a political sphere because without the political, we don't have a public. To, to have a public sphere, we need a political one, but we always want to escape from the political. Eventually, of course, the state acts and makes decisions and speaks in the name of values, but we need to make sure it's doing it in the minimum needed. And the effort to create public debates about important issue, and the effort not to give the state more than the minimum is the public sphere. It is not working with the state in harmony, but rather fighting with it. And when you have to, only when you have to, uh, working with it. Now, let's give, uh, let's try and give, I will try to give an example. Okay. This is a caricature for a couple of years ago from Israel. Um, and this caricature is referring to the ethnic conflict in Israel, what we often call today the tension between the first Israel and the second Israel, Israel Rishona, Israel Ashtia. And the caricature is talking about the ethnic demon, Hashed Adati, that you can see is, it is in a battle. So this is an issue that, according to the caricature, political parties, this is Shas, and it was during an election. I don't remember which, because there is a lot of elections in Israel, uh, but political parties used for political gain, for that purpose, they enhance the conflict and never, and never try to solve it. Now, if the tension can be solved, if the tension between the first Israel and the second Israel, all this... Uh, uh, ethnic demon, it won't be through the political system adopting the issue, but through civil and public action, and possibly even by fighting against the political system itself. Now, it would seem that a topic so complex as the ethnic conflict in Israel cannot be solved without turning to the political system or without a financial aid. Eventually, we need money. But based on Leibovitch, uh, we must be aware of adopting a multicultural policy in this sense, because this is what multiculturalism uh, is doing. It's going to the state and demand it will fix the, these problems. But we don't want to do that according to Leibovitch. We don't want, we don't want to uh, turn the state as the responsible adult in the story, because 
there is no there is no doubt that funding and taking responsibility are required of the state. Eventually, uh, it will have to do that. But the state cannot provide a solution. Quite the contrary. The more quickly the state ra- rushes to take responsibility for certain issues, the more we can be sure the state is gaining something, the political is gaining something out of the situation. Now, I'm saying state, but I'm referring mainly to the political sphere, the political institutions. Another example uh, related, I think, to our current reality is dealing with Omicron, COVID, you name it. And in the last two years, most debates in Israel relating to COVID focus on the political sphere as the one that makes all the decisions and as the factor that shapes our lives. We neglected our citizenship, citizens' power to influence our life, uh, to reduce injection, injection, endorse local businesses, gave up, we gave up to give up on mass events, if, even if that is not forbidden and no one told us to do so. Instead, we concentrate our life on the political aspect of whether this action is forbidden or not by law. Um, this is, I think, from the last few days, we can see her a pupil that is getting all this ping pong in his head because we have in one side the Ministry of Health on, on the other side the Corona Cabinet. Uh, whether or not he can go to school. Still, I don't understand uh, why we have a pupil. We need to see his parents, uh, I think. But w- we are giving up on our wisdom and ability to make a change. Uh, during COVID, I think, in Israel at least, we gave up the public sphere. And without a doubt, what I'm offering uh, raises questions. Can we really distinguish public from political? We need the, polit- we need the political sphere. Leibovitch is, is saying that we need the political sphere because without the political, we will kill each other. And not only to make sure we are not harming one another, because the political is obviously more than that. How can we def- and how can we define a state as Jewish and the climate related to any Jewish values? That is a big question regarding uh, Lebovich. And Lebovich claim regarding putting the public as opposed to the political result from his stance regarding the eternal fight of values one needs to make about his belief in ends. However, it is hard to escape the political. Eventually, we will have to approach it. Approach it. But, but that is the point. I claim we should not make the eventually to initially. The political is dangerous, and we should strive to realize our values without turning to the political and without closing ourselves at home. We should not give up, give up uh, on the idea uh, of the public sphere. So, thank you so much. I forgot to unmute myself. Thank you so much, Lilag. Uh, perfect timing. And at this point, I would like to invite members of the audience to please start placing your questions, comments, concerns in the chat box. Uh, and I will do my best to, uh, to moderate uh, the discussion that way. We, uh, it is late in Israel, um, and so we are really grateful Lilak, for taking time away from, uh, from your children, from your family to engage us. In they will be fine. Yeah. They will be fine. Don't think they are complaining about it. You can see my parents laughing. Well, I would uh, say that we have about a, a good 20 minutes uh, or so to... Uh, to engage the questions that might be uh, coming in. And maybe just to get the ball started, let me uh, ask you, Lilak, the following. I was um, genuinely surprised when, and maybe other people in the audience are also surprised to hear you say that Israelis are giving up on the public sphere, that Israelis are not engaged in the struggle, in the fight to battle out their values, This is certainly not the Israel that I know. This is not the Israel that I saw during the long period of political instability when so many people 
day in, day out, demanded an end to Mr. Netanyahu's uh, long uh, years of leadership. I think Leibovich, maybe not the method, that the fact itself, what he might have seen on the television screens, probably would have made him very happy. Or would it? Over to you. Um, I don't think he would be very happy about anything, because uh, you know, but talking about Netanyahu, this is, okay, Netanyahu is, is I think, very interesting example uh, because I, I don't, would, he is a, a very powerful politician. So according to Leibovitch, when something is happening in the political sphere, so we have to say what is the political sphere, but I think we can agree that the Knesset is definitely a political sphere. And according to Leibovitch, you, you cannot for real uh, achieve values in the political sphere. I, this sound, this sound this exactly what I said. That sound weird, like laws uh, 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 and all the work of the Knesset is something that deal with values. They have to do it, but what Leibovitch is saying, they have to do it, but they should not do it, but they still have to do it. So I think if to trans translate what he's saying to a more uh, simple, he's saying you should beware when you see a leadership like Netanyahu, which is serious lead a, a leader in Israel, it doesn't mean that uh, uh, he, he cannot do anything good. I, I'll be the last to say that. I think he's, he, he did good things, but he, in everything he's doing, when he acts in the political sphere, he, has, he is gaining power, a lot of power. And when all the debates, all the debates are concerning whether or not Netanyahu uh, uh, in Israel, you know, uh, Bibi steam, uh, yes, Bibi, no Bibi, uh, this is how I think we got to so many elections in Israel. So I'm, I'm, I, how to say that? I agree. Uh, so to say that in theory, not always work quite well when we look at the reality in Israel. That's true. But I don't think there is enough public sphere in Israel because when everything related to the political and to the political power, you can see that uh, in, I think Netanyahu is a good example because a lot become related to his persona and who it is. And a lot of important issue are, I think, forgotten in the way. And this is the political sphere fault. I blame the political because that's what Leibovitch is, uh, that's what Leibovitch did. Great. Uh, thank you, Lilac. And uh, there are questions coming in. I, I certainly don't want to monopolize, but, but you're really just prompting me to, uh, to ask a quick, quick follow-up question. So in those, and I certainly understand the point. Uh, however, one could also see in those anti-Netanyahu protests demands for a good, clean, non-corrupt, a, a, a different way of Israeli Israel that's free of corruption, political leadership that's free of corruption, that's, um, that's a different way of running the country's governance. Would that still be regarded as too overly politicized from Leibovitch's perspective? I see. Uh, yeah, I, I, I honestly saw, thinking about it and thought about it uh, a lot on the last a few years in Israel, because I think about Machiavelli, okay? Mm -hmm. Like Machiavelli saying, there is no way to do things right in the political, you only, the good way is to hide it well. If you hide it well, you are a good politician. And I think Netanyahu, I'm not saying anything mm -hmm. about that he did something, but let's say uh, for a second that he did, let's say he did, he was, Machiavelli would say, yeah, he was managed to hide it well, and in the minute he was not able to do so, so he fell. I, I, I don't believe that. Not, I think reality is more complicated than that. And I think our effort to demand politics will be clean is to create a public sphere. If you demanding that, of course, uh, people uh, will say, do you demand that? Or do you demand that just in order to, you want Netanyahu out? I think it's like so, so complicated. Uh, 
this uh, discourse around Netanyahu. So you don't know what people are saying. Like, uh, yeah, but we had another politician who was so uh, uh, corrupt and you didn't say that. So, right. but the demand itself right. that you want pol politics to be clean. Let's say if someone from the Likud party uh, uh, who has a lot to uh, lose from saying to go against Netanyahu, not to gain power, would lose. We do that, maybe that uh, would be to create a public sphere. The thing is, it's so, it's hard to know when someone is doing something inside the political sphere, why is he doing that? This is why it's so hard to divide politi for the political from the public, because you never know. Thank you, you made that very clear. Thank you, Lila. So uh, we have, uh, two questions, and I see one hand. So let me just uh, read out the questions. Uh, I will group them uh, according to uh, the, um, the person asking, and then I will uh, make sure, uh, Ayal, that uh, you will have an opportunity to, to ask your question uh, from Lilak. So uh, a question from Ayal. Uh, first question. Thank you, Lilak. Isn't there a possibility to create a political sphere, which is indeed the bare minimum, but one? that will not exclude groups, but due to its minimality, will rather include different types of people and values. And then Eyal has a second question, so let me just share that also. What are the differences between the public sphere, according to Leibovic, and the civic culture paradigm by Verba and Almond and others? Can they be intertwined? Okay. Uh, hi, Eyal. Uh, okay, so according according the first question, so let me see if I'm understanding right what you are saying. You're talking about a bare minimum, but we still uh, will not exclude groups. Okay, so obviously I think you are asking what Leibovitch is saying because this question has different answer. Do you ask liberalism? You ask Ross? You ask Kimlika? Uh, Kimlika? Who are you asking these questions? Uh, if you ask uh, Lebovich, um, can, first, Lebovich is talking about the minimum. Seder, according to Lebovich, the political sphere uh, is the minimum. What is the minimum that we are not killing each other? And still, if we want a, a, a state of our own, we are. A, a, we are, as the people, we want a state uh, of our own. That's also fine, we can have a state, but it is not a value. So in order not to exclude anybody, the point will be not to put any values inside the political uh, system. That is one thing. And second thing will be that if you have minorities, this is a very serious problem, according to Leibovitch, because uh, they will have a hard time to find themselves inside this political sphere. And he has different approach. So general, uh, if I need to choose between yes and a no, I don't know what to say, that a yes and a no, because in Leibovitch, there is no yes and no. There is only, you need to, you cannot do it, but you need to do it. You cannot really make this political sphere possible, but you need to do, to make any effort to include everybody and to make everybody part. He was, he, he was very, uh, li he, not liberal, I should be very careful about that, but he was very democratic uh, in that sense. Uh, and the second question, okay. About civic culture, I think what is unique on Leibovitch, because we have more uh, thinkers who is talking about section and division like we have civic culture and political culture. And we, we have, a, when we have a public sphere, there is a, a lot of ways to describe it. What I believe unique to Leibovitch is not the fact that he is talking about the public sphere. Habermas is talking about the public sphere. Rolls is talking about the public sphere. Arendt is talking about the public sphere. Everyone, everyone is talking about the public sphere, but eventually everybody connects the public to the political. What Leibovitch is doing, he is trying to disconnect, only trying, because you cannot disconnect a political from public. There is no way. You have no political, you have no public. That, that's it. But he is trying to do it, like he's trying to fight, not physically, but almost 
physically fight. And I don't know anyone uh, who is doing that, not uh, even not, I think, Chantal Moff, people that seriously uh, uh, talking about how important that we will have a good and vital public sphere. No one is saying, let's fight, let's fight the political and this is how we will create a, a public sphere. Great, thank you, Lilat. Uh, the next uh, question slash comment is from Arya, Arya Cohen. Does not demanding a minimal state itself embody a political decision against redistribution of wealth and the welfare state? In other words, isn't the minimal state seems to be a value-laden concept, isn't it? Rather than a value, a value-free concept. Absolutely. I agree. And that is exactly the problem with, Le with Leibovitch, because he's saying something like it's hard to achieve. He's talking about no values in the political sphere. Okay, so we have no state because a state cannot, I don't know, open its mouth without uh, saying something that related to values. He, he said, no, only, uh, only to make sure we, we are not killing each other. First, that is a very important value to make sure we are not killing each other, but even to put, let's put that aside and say, everybody agrees that we should not kill each other. A state is business when it comes to health, when it comes to security. If it's as any educational system, it has to deal with values. So what Leibovitch is doing um, is to do what cannot be done. It sounds better in Hebrew. Okay. This is Leibovitch. He needs, we need to do that, but we cannot uh, do that. Um, I actually, I actually have a nice story about it, which I heard from Avi Sagi. Uh, when I met him at Hartman, he uh, is, of course, uh, I wrote about Avi a lot in my dissertation because it's investigating Leibovitch, and he, he knew him very, very well. So he told me this nice story that once he was sending Leibovitch a letter and asked him to give charity for a woman, which uh, she left Judaism, she, uh, uh, she converted her, uh, her faith to something else, and she was in a very hard position, and Leibovitch sent him a letter and said, I don't think you should help her because she left Judaism, and that is not okay, we should not help this to, uh, these people. P.S., there is a check. So this is, this is what he's doing, saying to do something, but we are not able to do so. And I told David, this is a very good story. That's a wonderful anecdote. What a great illustration. I mean, that's, thank you for sharing that tonight. Uh, as I promised, next I will turn the microphone, so to speak, over to uh, Ayal Yeheskel. Uh, Ayal, I think you wanted to ask the question rather than write in the chat, so please yes. go right ahead. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Lilach. Hey, Lilach. Um, nice. I, I think I have a simple question, hopefully. Um, um, uh, what is, is value exactly? Because it seemed to me that there is difference between, um, you, you try to give two examples, or more than two examples, but there is difference between, I, I, I don't really understand what is the value that we should fight for or fight on regarding uh, COVID, for example. Uh, um, so I, I'm wondering if, if there is like um, how uh, Leibovitch will, will think about uh, values or what, what is value or does there are values that are not fit for fighting in public or I don't know. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Aya. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, thank you for that question. Um, According to Leibovitch, he has a nice quote about it, but I won't bring it. According to Leibovitch, maybe I should say that, but I, I, I was afraid so much, I, I won't have uh, enough time. We have three kinds of, uh, first we have values and we have needs, and needs cannot be values. So we can say according to that, that taking care of people uh, not to be hungry, uh, it's just a human need, it's not a value. Even nationalism, according to Leibovitch, it's not a value, it's human needs. It's also something that creates a lot of problems, but 
let's put that aside. We have three kinds of uh, values, let's say. We have one kind of values which is to put um, God in the middle. So if someone wants to worship God, this is one kind of value, religious values. We have another kind of values, which is to put humankind in the center and saying that I want, I don't, I don't want to say worship humankind, and although Lebovich will, will say, yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I meant. Um, that's to be a universalism. Uh, I don't know if liberalism, it's a debate, uh, but uh, secular, secularism, that is the second kind. And that or that are fine. Okay, he called uh, this is the one a fine worldview and another kind of worldview, and you can choose what you want. You can you can worship God and you can worship a, a man in the good way, uh, okay? But there is another kind of uh, world values, which is to put the state as the most high highest thing, mm -hmm. and that is fascism, and that is ayon uh, venora, and that is the end of everything. So it's divided it. In my dissertation, I wrote it. I wrote it um, a, a, a couple of times because everything that Lebovich, when Lebovich is talking about values, it is neither that or that or that. Of course, reality is more complicated. But again, he was not very bothering from. He was a thinker. He was a philosopher. They don't care so much about reality. And action and thought, very different realms, yeah. So uh, we do have, uh, with your permission, Lila, two more questions and one closing comment. Um, and the next question is from Maurizio, uh, Maurizio Horn, who uh, thanks you for the great presentation, Lila. And the question is, do you consider the abstract separation between spheres, public, private, political, can or should be performative as spilling over social change or inducing a different state, government, organization, structure, division of power, and et cetera. And uh, let me just share the other uh, question that came in. And I don't see uh, the first name, uh, so I can only say it's from Mr. Or, uh, Ms. Schultz. The question is, wasn't the main thrust of Leibovitch's political idea at the time uh, that the continued occupation is a threat to Israeli democracy and morality? And uh, back to uh, Arye, Arye Cohen, who uh, wants to remind us that Besofo Hadavar, uh, Leibovich, who mystican. So do you agree? Do you not? Uh, and the final words are over to you. Well, I, I just have to say before answering to Arye, you just killed him again. If you are saying he's a mystican, of course, because he was against that. But yeah, that that's like everything he's saying he is not eventually is a little bit. So yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, about uh, Maurizio, um, I think I asked myself that. I, I believe this is like a philosophical, this is my research. I, I, I wrote a PhD, but I, I truly believe in a good public sphere. I truly believe in that. I truly believe it can make a change I don't know how much, you know, because this is still very philosophical, but I, everyone who, who write political philosophy believe this is important, I think. Otherwise, uh, uh, he wouldn't do it. So it is a good question to ask me in a few years or to see in a few years if I will be managed to translate this philosophical work to something uh, I don't know. To, I don't want to say useful because philosophical is useful as it is, but something that can make a change in Israel, in our society. I truly believe in that. This is why uh, I wrote it. Uh, so yeah, you you got me. You you understand what what I meant. Thank you. And about wasn't. Um, the occupation as a threat to Israeli democracy and morality. Of course, of course. I didn't talk about it, but it's you cannot escape that in Leibovitch. Uh, so whenever you go, is there? Uh, this is there and separate from reality. He has a few ideas that he repeats and repeats and repeats, but that is not boring at all. Every time he repeats it, and it's very very interesting and, and different. Uh, but yeah, he saw the occupation as a threat 
about all the Israeli project and democracy. And when he is talking about creating a public sphere and stuff, that is not very related to that. It is related if you are fighting against occupation, according to Leibovitch, you are creating a public sphere, absolutely. But it, it was such a big deal to him that in some point in his late work, it, 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 his late uh, life, he said, you know what, that's it. Until you, there is no occupation, there is no need to speak about anything. There is no public, there is not even a political sphere. At some points he was convinced that there is no, the, the, let's say, Israel has lost something so essential that maybe it is no longer a state. So I'm not agreeing with that. But I have to say that and I also wrote it in my dissertation because that was a big, big deal for him. Nilak, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for staying up so late to tell us again uh, about this fascinating- That is not late. <laughs> I'm sorry that it's so not late. Um, and moreover, thank you for fielding all the, uh, the, the thought-provoking, challenging, uh, but certainly very, very interesting questions that came from from the different corners at the end of the talk. So really, Kol HaKavod, thank you so much. And um, we look forward to hearing uh, the good words so that we could congratulate you in a few days when, like the Shas politicians whom you showed us, you will probably also be opening a bottle of some bubbly, <laughs> celebrating uh, the receipt uh, of, your, of your doctorate, and we will be thinking of you. Um, friends, thank you for joining us once again. And uh, before I would let you go, let me remind you that our events and uh, intellectual activities are only beginning uh, this semester. We will continue next week uh, and the week after with two upcoming talks. Next week, we will be um, on the same day, on Tuesday, we will be hearing about Israeli space research, uh, Israel searching for exoplanets. So we are shifting gears, moving from Yeshaya Hulaibovich towards, uh, towards the stars. And then on January 27th, uh, International Holocaust Remembrance Day, but uh, we will be uh, hosting uh, Hila uh, Abraham from uh, the Jerusalem Cinematheque, who will be telling us about the completion of a fascinating project, a uh, multi-million dollar project that uh, makes um, 125 years of Israeli documentary footage available to the public. And so please, if you are interested in history, if you're interested in documentary um, uh, footage, please uh, join us uh, to learn more about this fascinating project. And last, but certainly not least, I would like to thank our communications coordinator, uh, Lisa Komlos, who has been actively working uh, in the background to make sure that this event can take place as wonderfully as it did, and, uh, and that all the technical uh, setup is uh, always uh, so properly looked after. So thank you, Lisa. Uh, for everything that you've been doing. And once again, Lilak, uh, we look forward to hearing uh, when you receive the doctorate. And in the meantime, um, uh, stay healthy, keep your family healthy, and uh, we look forward, hopefully soon enough, seeing you in person, uh, not just on the screen, in uh, the streets of Montreal and on campus at Concordia. The same Hagdalai, Laila Tov. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, bye. Thank you.